Okay, let's talk about the long lost golden age and extreme long distances of time. And if there ever was a golden age of civilization that people talk about in ancient myths. For if you want to find a lost civilization, all you really have to do is look at the civilizations that we see at the earliest of our civilizations we can find. For there are sacred geometry and all kinds of things that these people knew that we're just finding out that they knew and it's not readily known and just pushed out there that these people knew some incredible knowledge. Quite often when I show these as ooh parts we've shown quite a few videos here just this year it seems to be the theme going through this year and so this might should have been a primer before I started this year for it came out in 2020 in November in the end of last year but I haven't gotten to it till now but let's discuss lost golden ages for it goes along with a lot of myths that we've talked about but if you want to find a lost civilization it's Egypt it's Sumeria it's the ancient Hittites that people are just finding out about it's about Troy it's about the ancient people of Catalhoya it's about the people that built Stonehenge for whenever I was a kid they didn't have all this excessive knowledge that they have of these situations now. And any fringe parts that were discussed about it were really looked and shunned upon. They are quite a bit to this day. But it shows you that folklore and mythology had some type of reality in it. Let's just get into this. Long lost golden age. Is it just a myth? The myth and folklore of ancient cultures speak of a vast cycle of time with alternating dark and golden ages. Plato called it the great year. Most of us were taught that this cycle was just a myth and that the golden age is just a fairy tale. Only, it's actually right there in the procession of time and we're going to get into that a little bit. But there's a greater year than that also. And what we find is due to the wobble and procession of ourself like a top doing some spinning thing at the very top of our pole, it causes a, a wave effect to go through the grand procession of the year. So it's not just a linear thing. And in fact, our galaxy is not just spinning on a flat disc like a record but if you've had any little warped records whenever you were a kid long ago if you even know what records are anymore if you lean down and look at them quite often you'd see it go around and there'd be this little hump and a little hump and a little hump it goes through this situation we go through this rhythm of time that goes through that other than the equinox and the great year that we're talking about now there's a secondary component to this where we're doing that great hump situation deeper than that there's an entire thing where we're doing the solar procession here adding up to a great year we're also going through the hump of the record in a rhythm but in a certain amount of period of these rhythms we spin all the way around the galaxy. So we're going around the solar system and one time around ends up being a year. 25,920 basically years it takes for it to roll back through a procession of time and you end up going through different zodiacs all the way through the 12 zodiacs and back to itself showed in a recent video how up over here at the top there would be damages 
and down here at the bottom too of times when we found volcanic events and other events that have been well known and well documented that keep processing on this equinox time periods so we go through these reoccurring time periods of destruction and the strange thing is they end up showing at about the same time in this zodiac procession and it goes way back as far as we can record it. Randall Carlson and a few others have documented this situation and I've tried to do it for you myself to show you the vastness of this situation but also where does this knowledge come from? This is the knowledge of the ancients. This is another Upart situation where you're thinking these guys, they just started farming. And then, no, no, those guys that just started farming, before they even had written language, had all this crap figured out. Math was the first written down language. And it was being able to kept inside mentally. Like you can mentally picture things. Like a lot of the things I'm talking about now because there's not a picture up there. Let's explore this fairy tale. Giorgio de Santinella, former professor of history of science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT as we know it in the USA, tells us this idea of a cycle went far beyond the Greece and India that we know about having this situation. In their landmark work, Hamlet's Mill de Santinella and co-author Hertha von de Schind show that the myth and folklore more than 30 ancient cultures mention a cycle of time with long periods of enlightenment broken by dark ages of ignorance. Moreover, they show that it seems to be connected to or driven by a known astronomical phenomenon, the processions of the equinox. <coughs> when you look at the yugas of India, it correlates to these time zones over and over again and in fact we're supposed to be being in a dark and dumb age right now according to their ideals of it we're supposed to be in that situation now but we're not so much are we in fact we're in an age of enlightenment perhaps sometimes these things are backwards but if we looked at it in an overall situation we're currently in a lull and have come out of it rapidly recently. If you took a few thousand years off us, then we really wouldn't be as advanced as we think that we are right now. It's been amazing what we've been able to do at the age of enlightenment and releasing of certain ideals and man's quest for knowledge of truth and what it's really about. Developing science and finding the reality of it all. So this is where modern science may now be giving us some startling new evidence. We all know the two celestial emotions that have a profound effect on life and consciousness somewhat. Earth's rotation on its axis causes humans to move from a waking state to a sleeping state and back again every 24 hours. Our bodies have adapted to Earth's rotation so that it produces these regular cycles and changes in consciousness without our even thinking the process to be remarkable. Although I've dwelled on, why do we sleep? Animals go to sleep, you know, and it's, it's been proven a fact that you'll just go mad and die if you can't go to sleep, if you don't sleep. You have to have that rest because you're burning so much energy. And if you think about it, you need about eight hours sleep. But that leaves one-third of the day gone. And one-third of your life, basically, is taken away due to sleep. Yeah, you're spending a third of your life in an altered state of consciousness where you have a dream world and all of that going on. It's, it's quite remarkable. So this is that procession that we're looking at, and this blue swirl at the top of it is coming off of our pole, and right now it's aiming at our pole star. 
but it has over time changed what our pole star is because we've got this 23 degree wobble that goes on through the whole situation. But this is basically an astrolab situation, a dual astrolab situation, where if we were saying that all the constellations and all the stars were the same equidistant from us and painted on a glass bubble around the Earth that's like a golf ball in the center of it, what it would look like looking from the outside. Strangely, we talked about this recently in a just a video last week that I had put out, or well, it's about two weeks ago now that I had put out, and looking from the outside in the way that it looks whenever you're in the Grand uh, Central Station terminal in New York, and the depiction is done backwards, but that that's the way that old maritime maps used to be from this situation. It's a way of looking at it, way of looking at things. This red line is the equator. And so it spins and processes in a way, and that's looking at it from outside of the celestial dome, if you will. The second is Copernican mode, the motion revolving around the sun. It has an equally significant effect, prompting trillions of life forms to spring out of the ground, to bloom, to fruit, and then decay, while billions of other species hibernate, spawn, or migrate in mass. Our visible world literally springs to life, completely changes its color and stride, and then reverses with every waxing and waning of the second celestial motion. Again, we're so used to this that we hardly think of it noteworthy anymore, but you do think of the idea of now we're coming into spring, depending on what time of the year you see this, or we're coming out of the cold and into spring, we're hitting Easter, and that's that point whenever there's more sunlight than darkness. Through the whole winter, there's been more dark than light. And all of a sudden, it reaches a certain point, And the full moon around that and certain things kicks in life and rebirths the planet again. And it goes through that phase again. And it keeps going and going and going and going year after years after years. But we hardly think of that really either. The third celestial motion or libration or the procession of the equinox is less understood than the first two, but if we're to believe the ancient cultures, its effect is equally transformative on ourself. What disguises the impact of the motion is its time scale. Think of it this way. Like a mayfly, which lives but one day a year and knows nothing of the seasons, are anything different than what it faced. The human being also has an average lifespan that comprises only one three hundred and sixtieth of the roughly twenty four thousand year professional professional cycle. And just as the mayflyer mayfly is born on an overcast or a windless day, it has no idea that there's anything as splendid as sunshine or a breeze. So do we, born in an area of materialistic rationality, have little awareness of a golden age or higher states of consciousness, though that is the consistent ancestral message. Go over that again here real quick. It's kind of important to note and this is one of those things where you can get an example out of a situation. A mayfly lives such a short lifespan, it only witnesses such a small point in time that it can't rationalize what's going on in the longer scale of things whatsoever compared to something that lived as long as a butterfly even. But then people have a lifespan that's basically about 72 years, which comes out to be one degree... And that's that number, it's in the Bible and so on, but that 72 year roughly cycle is about how long a human lifespan lives. We're starting to extend it now somewhat, but if you took all the people that died at 35 and all the people that died at 100 and you it out, you come out to about 72. And that's literally one 360th of that cycle. That's that 360 of the Sumerians 
that declimate how much degrees are in a circle and how much that wheel goes around and around and how it all connects with time. We'll talk about later about how we might have lost some of this, but there are things that should not have been lost, things that should not have been forgotten, and there's surely things that should not have been not talked about anymore or in hushed tones are kept only to certain people, if you will. So, uh-oh, I think it locked up on me. Yeah. Let's just do a reload here. So these 24-hour cycles that we talk about, that we're going through, and then you have 360 of those, roughly, 365 and a quarter, if you will, make up a year. And then there's a whole lifetime of years. But then there's eras that go inside of that. And zodiac signs that people are going through that last 2,000 years roughly. And that's only a small section of the pie of the big thing that we go through. And while we're going through that wave that we were talking about, that high point is fantastic. But there's a low point too. Now, when we have this situation... We talk about the, in the year and the fact that people look at the, what's invisible to your eyes. What They know what's there at night, so they know what's there during the day. So they're referring to water in the day that you can't see because of the sky. That's another strange part of it all and the mysticism of it all. But in that situation... There's a dark and a light, and it corresponds to winter, roughly. So while you have a high and a low, and you have a summer and a winter, it comes around to that effect, too. But also, it seems like that things happen right here and right here quite often in our processional cycle are exactly at that somewhat interval. Like in the process of going up and down, we run back into a whole bunch of stuff, which is really nothing more than flying down a dirt road like if you've ever lived out in the country, and you'll run into a pile of gnats, and it hits your windshield all at once. And you go, man, those things were traveling fast. No, they weren't. You were traveling fast, and you ran into them, and a lot of people don't realize the motion of the earth and how the fact that we're hurling along, and so we run into this trash every once in a while and go back through it. Some of this trash appears to be in our own solar system and remnants of things that got busted and there are asteroids, and we'll go into that here shortly, that are blown out in one direction and that shows you that, but it also shows you we have that motion for we're carried on and they're keep getting pulled back towards us as we zip through. It's not just flat like a record either. We kind of corkscrew through the galaxy and get pulled along by the sun. So, as Georgia and Herthia point out, wow, it's going to reload this quick. They've apparently put on a new thing that has ads that come up on it, and if you try to squinch it and ignore the ads or something... Sometimes it'll just kick on that ad right there. So, as George and Herther point out, the idea of a great cycle linked to the show, uh, slow procession of the equinox was common to numerous cultures before the Christian era, but then lost. But now an increasing body of astronomical and archaeological evidence suggests the cycle may have a basis in fact. 
More importantly, understanding its ebb and flow and the character of each epoch provides insight into civilization's future and possible destruction. So far, the ancients are right on. There does seem to be evidence of a high lost age in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, in ancient India, etc. We're really looking at the Fertile Crescent and so on, but that's all that we find now. For most people don't think about it either, but long ago, when these places were just starting out, everything was a lot more fertile in this area. We were going through another one of those great seasons. Not necessarily in the great years idea, but yes, to where we're going through different seasons. For it slowly turns into the fact, because of this procession, and the way we're spinning around, and the way we lean back for summer and lean up for, for winter, that we slowly become winter is summer and summer is winter. Yet once we get on the other side of the zodiac from where we are now, the seasons will be reversed. It's a weird thing to think about, but in the in-between of these things going on, and the sweeping of tsunamis and certain things like that, they found out now, looking into it, everything changes, and the desert becomes green again in the Sahara, because instead of going this way and drawing drier and drier air upon it, it draws in from the ocean, in all its abundant clouds. Yeah, so that leads to the fact of other people having drought situations and wetter in other certain areas but giving that band right there it was very fertile crescent we say fertile crescent now and you look at it and it's all withered away but at one time that was of the greenest of places on the planet not like a jungle but very much vivid long before the dark ages though we sunk into a period, though, when even Greece and great Roman empires collapsed, with famine, plague, and brutal inquisition as a rule, and finally the renaissance, or rebirth of scientific knowledge, helping us to emerge the depths of the Dark Ages. So what drives these changes, and what can we expect in the future? Understanding the cause of procession is the key. Well, we can all get wiped off the planet real goddamn quick if we don't pay attention, and looking at, you know, we have all this capabilities to go up into space and do things. And since I was a kid, there was ideas that, oh, there's an asteroid coming. We could shoot a rocket at it with enough explosives. And this is even predates nuclear stuff. Once we had that idea, we could just blow it up into a lot of little bits or something else. Well, if there's a big enough chunk coming in, if we don't do something to it, it's going to destroy everything. So if we blow it in a, up a bunch of bits and we end up going through an asteroid field, which looks like we're going through now every year, which I talk about around Halloween and the Torrid Meteor Shower, which we'll get into later, we would be running through something like that and hoping we wouldn't hit a big piece. Well, have you noticed in the news here, it just seems to be more and more prevalent that these streaking meteors are going through the sky everywhere and causing air bursts. Yeah, very, very common all of a sudden here we're having this situation. Certain people brought us back this renaissance, but they were going on other people's works and things that were kept by people and stuff, and the common person didn't know it. Like we know today, the shred knowledge out to the masses of people books and all of that and how that changed things but at one time here there were certain people that brought us out of the dark ages back into a golden age again where we seem to find ourselves but seeing all these meteors streak around it starts to get real prophetic and there's just all kinds of problems with it heavenly observations well the observation of earth's three motions is quite simple in the first rotation, we see the sun's rise in the east and set in the west every 24 hours. And if we were to look at the stars just once a day, we would see a similar pattern over a year. The stars rise in the east and set in the west. 
12 constellations of the zodiac, the ancient markers of time that lie around the ecliptic or the sun's path, pass overhead at a rate of about one per month and return to the starting point of our celestial observation at the end of a whole year. And if we look just once a year, like we were to take a snapshot and say maybe the autumnal equinox, we would also notice that the stars move backwards, retrograde, opposite to the first two motions of spinning clockwise. It goes counterclockwise at the rate of about one degree every 70 to 72 years. Again, this is in a human lifetime. We're stepping back. This is also symbolically what they keep talking about, too. At this pace, the equinox falls in a different constellation approximately every 2,000 years, taking about 24,000 years to complete its cycle through the 12 constellations. This is called the precession, the background motion of the equinox relative to the fixed stars. Right now, we're coming out of the age of Pisces, which we've been in, and Jesus, which is the reason he had a thing about fish, about the wedding and his symbol that we always have, which is a Vesca Pisces symbol. And sacred geometry symbol. We've talked about this quite a few times. Before that was the year of, uh, great year of Aries. Before that was the age of Taurus, Leo, and we go back from there. And you can see that symbology if you look back in time of people revering these things. And it wasn't just the fact that they had started rearing cows. That happened well before and coming through it. It's the fact of what it all meant. The standard theory of precession says it's principally the moon's gravity acting upon the oblate earth that must be the cause of earth's changing orientation to distant space. So they're saying that that extra little wobble is caused by the moon slinging around. This is the idea of if you hold on to a tetherball string and a ball on it, which is the moon on a ball and you're the earth and you're bigger gravity than that tetherball, but you swing it around yourself. As you do, you can feel it pulling on you. You have to lean back a little bit, and the faster you go, the more you'd have to lean back. And although it doesn't seem like we're going very fast at all, there really is quite a pull on it. In fact, you can tell how it moves the tides quite a bit around on the Earth. And that is one fantastic fact to our planet that helps to cause things to be exactly the way that they are is that there seems to be this little water change that keeps happening to the earth's oceans around the earth as this happens but however this theory was developed before astronomers learned the solar system could move and if you think about that, they sat there and thought that, well, everything is around the earth and we're not moving at all. And then the sun spins around us and all that stuff, right? And now they figured out, no, no, the sun's the middle of everything and we're spinning around that. And that's hard to believe. Oh, yeah, we're spinning like a top real fast. Zoom going around the moon. I mean, around the sun every year and everybody goes oh that's got to be bullshit we'd be thrown off and all these ideas come to mind you know but other than that the sun is hurtling along at an incredible rate of speed talked about in sacred geometry recently how our speed of going around the sun is some 666 thousand miles an hour that's where another place where that number comes in effect. And so there's numbers also that keep going with this situation too that the ancients noticed and these cycles. And they actually built our cycles of time and space, and measurement, and everything off of these situations. And it goes with the human body as a ruler so you can't forget. And somehow it was forgotten. And then it was kept. So ancient astronomical teachers 
teaches us that an equinox slowly moving or processing through the zodiac's 12 constellations is simply due to the motion of the sun curving through space around another star which changes our viewpoint of the stars from earth so a lot of people believe in this nibiru concept and that there might be a star but a brown dwarf burned out although if it's a twin why would it be so much aged and have gone through this effect and ours not but yet we're pulsing around this thing and that's the wobble and even though we've got a little tether ball of a moon the great tether ball that's causing it is some unknown planet that's way the hell out there that keeps pulling us around as a whole solar system like a tether ball does it come by us and Nibiru and wipe back through us no maybe not Think of it as the tether ball on the string. Maybe it keeps pulling us around and we never quite meet it. There might be some times whenever we're closer to it, but yet it's so distant to us that it wouldn't be an effect. And apparently it's something that you can't see readily. So it'd have to be a burned out planet, a husk of something that doesn't reflect well. You know, something that's dark colored doesn't reflect well or a burned out sun. It's got to be huge to if if it's that far off it's the more far off that it is the more huge it has to be to be causing the effects that we see in astronomy so to this date astronomers have not yet discovered such a star and they dismissed it as a myth but just recently january 2016 scientists at the california institute of technology or cit at caltech in California have publicly stated they have found evidence of a large gravitational influence on one side of our solar system forcing the minor planets like Pluto and Sedna to fall into elongated incline patterns. Consequently, modern science is now looking for either a ninth planet or a star affecting our solar system. And this is that Nibiru and the search for it. And whenever it came out that science was saying, well, something's weird about it, that's just true. But also, notice that these all go to the left. And short of these two that are going down here, everything comes out here. And so you could think of something coming into the inner solar system. This is us right here, trans-Neptunian objects. They're really not showing it to scale so much. But a lot of these come in around trans-Neptunian. They whip around through us. They worry, you know, if we get in the wrong spot there as it comes around through... A lot of them also, as our plane goes here, even though it's going up and down, these things are coming in from angles and zipping back out like this, right? Well, there's this other Planet 9 situation they know is coming out here, and there's this one that's out here that they've noticed, and it seems to be that weirdo because all these other things are like a shotgun blast and shot out like that, and they keep revolving right around here. There's this one that goes way out here. And this might be our situation. But then again, it's only about six times the size of the Earth if everything that they think currently is right to it. And that wouldn't put it as the size of a sun or even a burned out husk of one. But something as far out as that could be just a darkish planet. Doesn't have a lot of reflecting qualities all whatsoever and they just can't catch it. Beyond the technical considerations, a large mass would provide logical reasons why we might have a great year. To use Plato's term, with alternating dark and golden ages, that is, if the solar system carrying the Earth actually move in a huge 24,000 year orbit around another mass, subjecting Earth to the electromagnetic or EM spectrum of another star or EM source along the way, shaping the subtle electrical and magnetic fields through which we move or and even see we could expect this to affect our magnetosphere ionosphere and very likely all life in a pattern of commensurate with that orbit so just as earth's smaller diurnal and annual or annual motions of the year produce the cycles of the day and night and the seasons of the year both due to earth's changing position relative to the EM spectrum of the sun, so might the larger 
celestial motion be expected to produce a cycle of effects life and consciousness in a grand scale. Now one way of thinking about this is I just did a video not long ago about the color blue and whether we could see it or not and why the sky is blue. Well the sky is blue because the sun even though it looks yellowish orange to our eyes is putting out a huge amount in that spectrum. It also is putting out spectrums all the way to the red and some infra that we can't see but also it's showing that yellow uh, to green green to blue and even a purple in it and it's quite strong but drowned it out by the yellowish light and that's the reason the ocean is blue because once it goes down <coughs> and penetrates the water it doesn't take 10 foot before it starts shattering all the red away and really taking away from the left spectrum all the way to the right and the only thing left at depth reflecting all around and back up to us is blue and in fact this is why the sky is blue but in that we talked about how the blue might be something weird and everything and I don't know if something like this could affect it somewhat the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum which has to do with light and its spectrum to us might change in some way hmm that's just an odd thought here's the picture I used for the opener and it's just an idea of what somebody thinks Nibiru might look like if you look, it's kind of blue like Neptune, but it's not really light and lit up. It's just dark, and it's out there, foreboding out in the middle of nowhere. And But every once in a while, due to its interaction on us, it picks up planets from that outer Oort cloud and just slings them into the inside. And we talk about how Neptune and... Uh, directs things in somewhat but then Jupiter saves us all from it but if Jupiter's on the other side whenever it happens it doesn't even know it in fact if it doesn't interact with it directly it can't interact other people have found out the way the three line up if it just slings it in a little bit Neptune will grab a hold of it sling it on it slings it on like we slingshot things out into the outer orbits to look at planets and go beyond that's the same way we come in if you think that, you know, it saves us from everything, take a look at the moon the next time you're out at nighttime and tell me that coming right over your... Now, the moon faces us straight, so coming right over our shoulder, there's been hundreds of craters impacted on the moon that just barely missed us coming over our shoulder and hit the moon. Now, the moon could be anywhere at night, so how many of them just missed off our shoulder and then winged, and there was no moon in the way right there either, and it just went on, and one day it might come back. And they've already come back, and so on. And it goes on and on and on. We've been living through this plethora of time here where even though we've had these great catastrophes and everybody starts to go, oh my God, this guy is falling, the end of the world. You have no idea what's happened before and that we should be aware of. And instead of being all freaked out about climate change and everything, you want to talk about climate change and things that will happen, look at one of these events like this. And we, oh, well, we can't do anything about it. You think you can do something with the planet, like turn on the air conditioner or turn the down a little bit? What are you going to do? Release a bunch of Freon that's cool? We're going to make a big cooling device? Hell, every year whenever we run our uh, air conditioners, the air conditioner outside is putting out rampant heat and blowing out. So that's even adding to our summer. Oh, don't let somebody hear about that. They'll say you can't have air conditioners anymore. A hypothesis for how consciousness might be affected uh, by such a celestial cycle can be built on the work of Dr. Valerie Hunt, a former professor of psychology at the University of California, LA, and UCLA. In a number of studies, she found that the changes in ambient subtle electrical uh, EM and magnetic fields which surround us all the time can dramatically affect human cognition and performance. In short, consciousness appears to be affected by subtle fields of light that may have long-term effects barely understood at this point. Also, people worry about that, oh, 5G coming, and this, that, and the other, and there's going to be this tss going on, and you don't know about radio waves passing through your body, and who knows what's going on. Could it lead us to another level of consciousness?
So looking at this representation here, you see something like a sun and all of its electromagnetic waves going off of it. And if the sun goes through different cycles too, that we're unaware of because we're like the mayfly and we've only experienced it even in our whole recorded time of it only going through flares a couple of times, it's not well recorded either. There's been a lot of people recently have talked about solar flare events could, it, could have been some of these events that we're talking about too. Well, if the sun gets hit by something facing right at us, whenever it hits it, it puts out a burst usually, or a lot of times. And so you can imagine that if it, it, it rather than just the spark that could build up and go foof and come at us, what if something hits it during these times we're talking about of decent size, and in doing so, it causes a flare to pop out? We've seen a couple of these events already. But it's burped out over here to the right and shot one straight out to the left. Well, it shot one right at us one time and it caused all of our satellites to sparkle and do things. And it was really not that bad. But if you have one of those decent events come on, it could wipe out a lot of our satellites and cause a lot of electromagnetic problems. When the Earth tries to flip poles in situations like that, all kinds of things can happen. But again, we're through a plethora of good times here. Consistent with myth and folklore, the concept behind the great year or cyclical model of history is based on the sun's motion through space, subjecting Earth to waxing and waning stellar fields. All stars are huge generations of EM spectra, each one all out there, resulting in the legendary rise and fall of the ages over great epochs of time. So we're trying to put it together and hook it off of that. This is going to go to a part two. It's going to be in your upper left-hand corner. We're going to look at that there and continue on. This is something It's known as the Trondholm Sun Chariot. It's from about 1350 B.C., pulled by a horse. It's a sculpture believed to be illustrating an important part of Nordic Bronze Age mythology. Well, there's no question about it, for what we have is that idea of the Sun Chariot and the fact that there's a horse or a team of horses pulling across in a chariot so in the sun in the back in its own chariot right there is getting pulled across the sky and it gets pulled across the sky in every night and people could think that's as simple as it and then usually the card that's in front of it says something along that line if you get even that much description but if you'll look there's gold foil that's still left on that and if you got a real close look at it, that has little circles all over it, but a great circle in the center of it. And this all relates to the moon cycles and the sun cycles over time. And if you look, it has this thicker part that's right over here in one part of it and a band over here. And if you'll remember my video on the Nebra star disk, how it had this situation going on too with the sun boat and everything. And there's this little part that's right here. That has a thickness to it but right below it you might be able to discern there's these little circles that are circle 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 all the way around this thing and about that perimeter and people have realized that this is that cycle that shows sun and moon cycles so eclipses all of that situation also what else can we get from this other than the fact that the horse looks like it has an aardvark face like the god Seth for some reason but if we look at the wheels there, they have a four-spoked thing, and that goes with the Zodiac, too. And not only does that go with the Zodiac, but so does this great wheel of time that's going on here behind it. And you can think of the idea that there's a mechanism hooked up to it. And as this wheel spins, this thing slowly spins backwards one degree, real slow. So while these wheels are going forward and this horse is running this way, zoom, that thing's slowly going backwards. Or if you've ever seen a wagon wheel, whenever they get up to the right speed, even though it's spinning real fast going around like this, all of a sudden due to the flutter of the camera speed and everything, you can see all the spokes and it seems to slow down and then start going backwards a little bit. And you can even tell when they speed up and slow down, it starts to go forward and it starts to go around. You can see it in car hubs and things like that. Great cycles of time all connected into that. But there's also a couple of witch hat looking giant hats that they have there that have those same circles and same connections to it. And I've done videos about how that's that same thing, same circle, same size, same concept that goes on. 
and we found that the Greeks had it and everything. No, well, these people seem to have had it before. In fact, that idea that supposedly, oh, this guy found it. No, it, it goes before that. Such as the idea that Eratosthenes figured out a basic shape of or size of the earth. And we go, no, it happened before then. Oh, well, how can you prove it? Well, first of all, the pyramid seems to be showing us a representation of the earth and the difference on the great pyramids height and uh, girth of its belly or base is the difference on how wide the earth is by how tall it is and how do they know it in sacred geometry or anything well if you take that measurement and you times it times 432,000 it ends up being exactly well, closer to a measurement than we had in any time except for satellite imagery in a modern day. It took to the 1970s before we had a more accurate measurement than that one appears. Not only is it lined up to true north to the point that if somebody's trying to set up a building, they would get lucky if they got as close as that appears. There's that situation. There's also the ideal that in the size of its base, if you know about longitude and latitude, you can break those down into cubes and you can break them into smaller cubes and smaller cubes and it ends up being arc seconds that we talk about. And arc seconds worth of time is a real finite point of time. Only super astrologers would use that type of thing now and it's for calibrating telescopes. Yet we find that they're using it there in the Great Pyramid for if you take the base and people have noticed it's a hair off. What is that hair off difference? Well, it's exactly the difference of the height and width difference of longitude and latitude at the latitude that the Great Pyramids are at. Let's go to part two in your top left hand corner. See you there.